Recently, Daphne and I visited the home of Bob Bancroft, retired biologist. Bob is a man that I consider a friend, a colleague, and an ally in the fight to preserve Nova Scotia's endangered ecosystems. Bob has stood all his life for preservation and wise living, and it's not exactly a popular road to go these days. But something that is remarkable and almost unknown about Bob is that for 44 years of his life, he has been attempting privately with his own funds and in his own time to restore a region of forest around his home. To that end, he's immersed himself in the forest, bringing back many trees that were native to the area but extirpated. And as he has done so, he has seen his land come back to life, becoming a home and a sanctuary to wildlife with few other places to go. I thought it was time to finally tell the story of a place I have come to think of as the Bancroft Wood. Um, it was old farmland. I had the south-facing hill that I wanted. I had water that I wanted, not being on the coast. It was uh, balsam fir, white spruce, a little bit of uh, black spruce and red spruce uh, representation. Um, there was white ash and black ash that I found later, uh, white pine and, and uh, tamarack. And it is a gray glacial soil and, and when, you, when you have that soil, you get old field succession with tamarack as opposed to white, uh, white spruce. So uh, there was a poplar, a big tooth, and, and uh, trembling aspen, as they call it. So, um, so those were what was here. And I guess, for example, just behind the house here, uh, there was a stand of, of, of trembling aspen. And I just knew it was going to fall apart. And after being in a military family, I felt like staying somewhere for a while. So I planted oaks and red pines. And now the poplars are falling apart and the oaks are as tall as they are, so, and the pines as well, so. Bob and I share a strong interest in the restoration of biodiversity. And we are both working toward that end, each on our own land in our own different ways. I have set aside 110 acres of land to redevelop its natural ecosystems and have largely taken a hands-off approach to it while Bob is using a very informed, intensive management system to promote biodiversity, along with taking the approach of helping his forest be ready to adapt to impending climate changes. As we work toward these goals, we are both wrestling with the reality that a forest ecosystem is extremely complex and barely understood, and the chance of us restoring it is very minimal. All we can do is create a template for it to build on. Bob is extremely knowledgeable about local tree species, and listening to him reminds me that there are many more in the local area that I need to learn about. I came to Nova Scotia from Alaska, and there are many here I'm not terribly familiar with yet. I keep meaning to make this a subject of study, but every time I do, I discover new fungi, lichens, and flora that distract my attention. So I had a hint as to what was here before, and I went with that and used the, the, the remnants that, that they didn't cut down that I could find and, and uh, started off there, and then I added on the, the species that it uh, seems like climate change would, uh, would do something with. So. No, that's a blue jay carrying on. That's the call I recognize. We have a lot of those around. Yeah. They have different calls, and they make hawk calls, too, to clear the feeder when they... <laughs> Interesting. I didn't know that blue jays made hawk calls to clear other birds away from their feeding areas. Uh, bear bear marks on the, on the oak that's down there, so, and uh, the cedars are actually doing well and they're reproducing, which a lot of people say that that happened, but, uh, but they're, they're naturally reproducing, and that's the whole idea here, this is, this would be insane, except uh, now that I've got seed sources here, they're going to look after themselves. It was ironic for me as a biologist that uh, the biggest problem I had in planting was uh, the animals would get rid of it. I found, I, I planted uh, uh, black ash on an island and, uh, and muskrats ate it. <laughs> so, huh. so you can't, <laughs> yeah, I didn't plan on that one. I didn't bother to, to, uh, to protect them with wire and stakes. I spend a fair bit of time in what remains of Nova Scotia's mature and old growth forest and I have noted also what Bob was referring to there, that animals congregate to these areas because these are the places where they find the foods that their instincts tell them to look for. As Bob tries to restore his own forest, he finds animals flocking to the land 
and he has his own struggles managing the behaviors of that wildlife as they attempt to feed on the foods they should naturally be able to find on the indigenous trees he is attempting to restore for them. But are not able to do so now because Nova Scotia forests are so heavily subjected to the depredations of the forestry cartel. As Bob has worked to restore this forest, he's also worked to restore its soil and get its water quality back to its natural state. To that end, he's taken steps to ensure the health of local streams and brooks, and also dug in some ponds to serve as habitat for rare wildlife. When Bob described the trouble he had had digging in ponds into an area, I asked him why he had bothered. Because I had four toed salamanders here, and they were in a situation that was really bad, and I knew I had other I, I've got pictures of, uh, we have lots of yellow spotted you know, into our greenhouse. I think that's pretty incredible. He saw that he had a species of salamander that was in trouble on his land, and he decided to do something about it. He made a place for them. I noticed that as Bob was describing his woodland, he never missed a place where wildlife had either created habitat or found a residence within his woods. Often taking a moment to point up into the trees or down into the logs, or even into the muddy places of ponds and the shadows hidden by cattails to describe what species had moved into those areas. Oh, a little bigger than a flicker needs. A flicker made the hole? Uh, they would be a rock spot there and they would go in like a branch that broke off. There's a process there where it happens. In the if his forest has not provided habitat on its own, Bob goes out of his way to create it. I have a barred owl box over in the corner though. I, when I went to check it last year in May, <laughs> there was a bear up the tree beside it. <laughs> the love he has for his forest and all its denizens shines out as he tells stories about planting the trees and their struggles to reach maturity, as well as the denizens of the forest, the wildlife that has found its way there. They're covering what opening? Oh, but there's a den. Uh, I imagine a woodchuck or something made the original den, but then, and, and, and skunks have, are well, well equipped with claws, so they could have done it. But there's a den, and, and essentially the animal, at a certain point in the fall, they decide that they're going to go to sleep, and they just, they just break leaves into the entrance, and, and they're inside, and they're, they're grabbing the stuff and covering over the entrance to hide them, hide the den. Huh. So it's fun to see things like that. I enjoy it. I'm here with Bob Bancroft, and he's showing us around a forest that he began to restore, what, about 45 years ago? 44 years ago. 44 yeah. years ago. And that means that it's a juvenile forest. It's, uh, it's a long way from old growth, but there's some nice mature, some nice things happening here. You see movement toward mature woods, and we're seeing some, we're seeing some transition in the forest, too, as older plants die, new plants take their place, and Bob is doing his best to restore this forest and uh, get it back to being a living, a living local ecology again. Bob, what motivated you to do this? I'm not sure, except that I knew the forest was compromised. It was grown in over, over uh, farmland, and and uh, I, I tried to think about it in a conventional forestry point of view, and I didn't like the idea of plantations. And then I looked around a little more and found the remnants of what used to be here. And so I started thinking about spreading the yellow birches and the sugar maples and, and the other trees in amongst the existing pioneer species that were there and, and to, to, to make, it, make it more a diverse forest. And I took that a little bit further with uh, the climate change predictions. Uh, you look to New England and there's some trees that are doing very well down there that may not move fast enough for climate change, but, but the reality is that, for example, black walnut um, is, is a tree that uh, that, that does very well here. So I've, I'm up to about 50 different species and I can climb trees I planted. That's the good thing about staying in one place for 44 years. And I really wanted a healthy forest. I want, and I wanted to re recreate the kind of habitats that the animals had too. Hmm. So you're starting to see some wildlife or more wildlife move into this woodland, aren't you? More than we actually would expect because there's been so much clear cutting that the animals have been displaced and they've come here. Um, we wound up with a bald eagle over there <laughs> and a, a goshawk nest and a barred owl nest and, and it just goes on and uh, I guess if you there's a there's that movie that says uh, uh, build it and they will come it's about a ball field well actually if you build habitats they'll come 
cliff because I think and and almost anything will uh, that's it's better than a clear cut will do so uh, almost I anything's better than a clear cut <laughs> for animals. Yeah, that's right <laughs> you got that right so yeah it's a uh, uh, the biggest thing I've done is a, is a build a bear den and one came after I planted a whole bunch of apple trees that were bearing apples. It's all a long term process and I think people need to think in long term. That's why that's what forests are. Um, a lot of what I've done is, uh, is not particularly pretty right now but all the seed sources are here for a really fine forest somewhere down the line. And all I've really done is speed the process up. I mean uh, essentially if you had to keep doing the planting I've done over the last 40 years all the time, it would be foolish. But what I've done is establish the trees that are going to replicate themselves. And uh, that makes for a very diverse forest that's got all kinds of options for wildlife. And Daphne and I were walking through this forest through much of today and we saw a wide diver diversity of birds as we were going through the forest. But as we were going through, you were also discussing Many of the trees here seem to be struggling with immunity issues. They're dealing with insects and pathogens. Can you tell me some about that? Yeah, the pioneer forest, the, the spruces, the balsam firs, the, the, uh, the poplars and whatnot, uh, they really are a healing forest that tends to come in on, the, on the old pasture land. Um, they act as mineral pumps, especially the hardwoods. Uh, not so much the softwoods, but uh, and then they get diseased, and and they get uh, eastern spruce gall aphid, and they get a whole bunch of different things. So they're they're sort of a healing process that nature has to to cover the ground. And what I did actually was use the overstory of of those trees to get another series of trees started that are more long lived, like oaks and whatnot. And it's worked very well. Um, I have trees that are as big as the original trees already. And, and uh, but they're going to last longer, so they'll, they'll last longer than I will. That would be the plan. I love yep. In your estimation, how long would it take for this to really become an old forest again? Uh, 150 years. That'd be a guess. Yeah, that would be my own guess. Um, I know there's a lot of debate on that. I th what is the current standard in the province right now for something to be an old growth forest? 80 years? 125. 125? Yeah, at least has some, um, of course you need mixed age classes and I've been doing that because it's taken me 40 some odd years to, <laughs> to get this thing going so they're not all, and of course I don't plant the same thing at the same time you know, very much so. You were mentioning earlier that one thing the forest is lacking was, I know them as grandmother trees, I can't Recall the term you use. Hub trees. Hub trees. Is what the science more about that? To? Yeah, the, 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 we're coming up with new understanding that a lot of the older trees in a forest are mature trees. They're connected underground <coughs> to younger trees. And for example, if the younger ones, if there's a drought, the older ones with big root systems uh, and good good association with the fungi, the myceliums and whatnot will be able to nurse the young ones through a time period. I don't think this forest is anywhere near functioning like that. And of course, when people come in and cut trees, what they should be doing is leaving some of those older trees. And that's what the forest, if you look at a multi-age forest, that's what they have. They have a little bit of everything. And, and uh, this has not taken place here. And uh, uh, I'm hoping that eventually, uh, the, it's largely a clay forest uh, ground, uh, the, the, the subsoil, it does hold water well, and I'm, but, I'm, but I really got to get the soil regime back to a healthy state, not just the trees. And I don't think the trees will truly become healthy here until, until the, the soil is, is capable of doing that. How would you measure the soil for that capability? Well, there are ways of actually uh, taking soil samples. And I don't have an auger right here, but I do use them when I'm out in other people's lands. And you can check for fire whether there's been, often the fire has been human fires in the past, but it's, it's, it's hidden in a charcoal layer and, the, and, and you can look at the topsoil la layer and they're actually good books that will show you uh, soil development and you have to dig down. You can dig little pits too and, and, and come up with the same thing. So I've done that a little here and really this is somewhat compromised um, by the previous farming activity, but it's growing a forest. It is. And gradually, uh, I may be transplanting soils from another property that I own that has never been cut, as near as I can tell. There are no stumps, it's delightful. And, and, and trying to get make sure that all the different components of the soil 
are available. And I'm doing other things to, uh, like bringing in the salamander, back to salamanders. There's a lot of material, a lot of animals that were extirpated from this property and now they're gradually coming back. And in some cases you can help them. You can hear them even as we've been walking through here all day and even just now you can hear the various birds and the land is certainly coming back to life here. This is uh, an incredible project. It's a project of, of a lifetime, several lifetimes, really. I only have one, so I've done that again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. eventually it'll sustain itself, which is something I look forward to, and hopefully somebody else will be able to enjoy it. And uh, I know I won't live to be 150. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to. <laughs> Bob is very modest and often describes the forest that he's creating as a junk wood. He does so because the forest is struggling. It was recreated from an area that was farmed using poor practices. The soil was ruined. Many of the important trees were gone. The hub trees, as he noted. But bit by bit, patiently across decades, he has been taking careful, measured, and scientific steps to restore this forest. And more than scientifically, he has poured his heart into it, creating there an environment that welcomes wildlife and can be a sanctuary for both the flora and fauna that should be indigenous to Nova Scotia. I think what Bob has created here is truly remarkable and could potentially serve as a model for forest restoration throughout the Atlantic provinces.